So I'm very glad to welcome you all to this digital event uh, that the Swedish Society for Psychical Research arranges uh, with the topic Consciousness is Unbound. Um, I can say a few words about myself since I guess I'm rather anonymous. I'm president of the Swedish Society. Uh, I've been almost all my life, more than 30 years, so I know rather many researchers in the field, and I've been at conferences and met many of them, like Dean Radin, Rupert Sheldrake, Kim van Lommel, and, and uh, Peter Fennick, quite many people. Uh, so I know rather much of the, of the research, and I, of course, understand it's quite a big challenge. And I'm very glad you both accepted my invitation. I saw you digitally in September, uh, Ed Kelly and John Cleese, and I was inspired by your uh, inspiration and thought it could be a good chance to have both of you talk about your way into this research, into this strange phenomena and the far-reaching conclusions about, about uh, well, worldview far from physicalism, as you have in one of your book titles. And I'm, I've read much of your books, and I really find it fascinating. I'm very glad both of you could join us. Uh, my background is not from really from so many, much of university life. I have a background as programmer for 25 years. And then I slowly changed into twin telepathy research. Uh, where I had my PhD with a thesis on twin telepathy three or four years ago at University of Greenwich in London. Um, and you, Ed Kelly, you have, um, you are in Virginia, University of Virginia, I understand that you have much uh, experience from research and also editing books, quite heavy books, I think. Um, and John is, of course, most well known for us all as comedian. We all know of you, and I appreciate you are with us and also have a serious interest. I understand that in this strange phenomenon and the possibility that the consciousness may survive death. That's quite a big challenge for all the societies. <laughs> uh, we will do this like. Uh, uh, Ed Kelly, you start with about 20 minutes, your way into this research, this phenomena. Uh, then John Cleese, the same thing. How came you, how you came, became interested and what you find so fascinating. And then, then you both you can have a discussion about 10 minutes or 15. And then we will have questions for the audience and to take handle it, we will have them in the chat primarily, and my technician Rasmus will pick them up and read them. Uh, and in case we, will ne we need it, we will repeat the questions. Uh, that is how we take care of this uh, digital session with both of you. So I can perhaps uh, ask you, Ed, to start, professor in psychiatry. And if you start talking about this interest of yours. Okay, although I must say, I think uh, people are probably more interested in John than they are in me. I mean, John is extremely well known. What's not known is his connection to our field. And that occurred, actually came about right around the year 2000 or so, when John joined into a group that had be begun at Esalen, Esalen Institute out in Big Sur, California. Um, uh, the situation was that uh, Mike Murphy, the co-founder of Esalen, who's an extremely well-read and smart guy, uh, used, uses Esalen actually as a kind of think tank for himself. He has lots of intellectual interests, one of which concerns uh, big theories of mind, brain, and consciousness, and so on. Uh, he was certainly aware that if the prevailing kind of physicalism is correct, there cannot be any such thing as survival. But he also knew that there were people here and there around the planet who were actually doing research that seemed to be producing evidence 
supportive of the possibility of survival. So he organized um, one of his fellowships specifically around the subject of postmortem survival. And my wife and I were among the original participants. The thing went on for over 20 years. Uh, John showed up, I forget exactly when it was, John, but 2000 or 2001 or so, came to, came to several of the early meetings. And of course, I had heard- I, the very, John, I think I missed the very first one, Ed, and then joined you on number two. And then I was there for about 10 years till I had a very expensive divorce. Ah, uh, yes, <laughs> yeah. And um, I mean, like other people, we, we knew of John from his public persona, but had no suspicion that he was interested in these things. But it turned out to be a, a big part of his uh, inner life. In fact, I was very gratified several times to hear John say that those meetings out at Esalen were really the high point of the corresponding years for him. Anyway, going back to, the, uh, to my beginnings, uh, I was late in graduate school. Uh, undoubtedly a conventional physicalist, though not by taking hard thought about it, but just absorbing the atmosphere. I mean, bear in mind, this was the uh, 1960s. We were just emerging from the shadow of uh, behaviorism. Uh, it was still the case that the word consciousness was not to be spoken in polite scientific company. That's how it was. Uh, I was doing a, a dissertation on uh, an attempt to allow computers to distinguish uh, the main senses of high frequency words in English by looking around in the context that the word appeared in. And that had certain uh, kind of uh, modest uh, Im impact on computer aided content analysis, things like that. But for me, it had been rather a disastrous process because in the process of doing that work, I had become convinced that no computer on earth would ever understand the difference between metaphorical truth and literal falsehood. This was basically a fundamental flaw of the computational theory of the mind. So uh, here I was in a somewhat depressed state because my future professional path seemed to be uh, shutting down before me when I received a call from my mother one day who informed me to my great surprise that my older sister, seven years older than I, uh, had become a medium. Uh, my mother clearly was calling to uh, get my reassurance that this was okay. <laughs> Since I was a graduate student in psychology, I know all about it, right? Well, I didn't know anything about it, so I had to go look. And in doing so, among other things, I discovered this uh, large amount of experimental research, the same kind of stuff that I was being taught to do, uh, purporting to demonstrate the existence of things like telepathy and clairvoyance and precognition and psychokinesis, which I dimly realized could not happen if the prevailing picture were correct. So that certainly got my attention. My sister, by the way, I quickly concluded was not in any grave danger. I reassured my mother about that. Uh, but I then began a correspondence with J.B. Ryan, and ultimately, after I got my PhD and uh, had a, uh, a, a postdoc year as a fellow in computational linguistics, continuing basically the stuff I had started in graduate school, I moved down there to Durham and began doing work in parapsychology, experimental parapsychology. And although I still had some uh, reservations about the reality of the phenomena, those were rapidly obliterated when about a month into my stay down there, I met a guy who it turns out at the time was a first year law student at Yale. Uh, he was directed to us by one of my former undergraduate teachers who knew that I was working with Ryan. And this guy could do practically anything we asked him to do. Uh, I won't bore you with the details, but we published a long series of papers about him. He's undoubtedly one of the best subjects ever to come into a parapsychology laboratory. Now, I must say that, uh, I mean, that was all exciting and it cemented my interest in this kind of work, which I continued. But at that time, I think like most people coming at it from the scientific side, I, I think I really uh, expected and probably even hoped that some minor adjustment in our uh, 
physicalist worldview would sort of take care of these little anomalies. And the, uh, the long and short of my career ever since is that I've become increasingly um, pessimistic about that as time has gone by. And in fact, I'm now to the point where I really think once you abandon physicalism, which research in parapsychology forces us to do, there's really no place to stop short of something that's almost the exact opposite of physicalism. That is some, some form of idealist uh, metaphysics or conceptual framework or worldview or whatever we want to call it. And it's really, uh, I'd have to say that the bulk of my career for the, certainly for the past 20 odd years has been devoted to pursuing uh, that possibility uh, through these big books that well, I should probably show them to you. Um, first one, this, this is the first fruit of the uh, Esalen group, Irreducible Mind, that was published in 2007. And that uh, primarily seeks to assemble in one place a whole lot of uh, evidence that physicalist, physicalists can't deal with. Uh, at the top of the list, of course, is all the various psi phenomena. And we incorporated all all of that literature by reference because we didn't want to write a parapsychology book. And of course, lots of mainstream scientists would like to think that parapsychology is unique and that it can be sort of isolated and quarantined. And apart from that, everything's great. Uh, <laughs> but that's not the case. So the rest of the book dealt with some of those other things. And by the way, we did this very uh, self-consciously on the model of Myers's book. Uh, human personality and its survival of bodily death, a great neglected classic of psychology. So we have chapters in there on things like extreme uh, psychophysical influence, stigmata, hypnotic blisters, um, things of that sort. Chapter on memory by Alan Gold, I'm sure everybody's familiar with, uh, pointing out various unexplained properties of human, human memory systems. And these, by the way, come very close to the uh, ongoing debates in uh, philosophy of mind about consciousness and whether consciousness can or ca cannot be accounted for in physicalist terms. Um, just uh, to persevere on that for a moment, uh, some things are happening in the broader culture that I think, scientific culture that is, uh, that are gonna be helping us. And certainly recent developments in philosophy of mind is one of those things. I think it's fair to say that many good philosophers of mine have become convinced at this point that uh, consciousness cannot be explained in physicalist terms, the hard problem, David Chalmers and all that. Uh, and so a, a lot of these philosophers are becoming more open to things they would not have taken seriously even two decades ago, like panpsychism, for example, radically different theories of consciousness. Uh, let's see, then we have a good chapter on um, uh, psychological automatisms and secondary centers of consciousness by Adam Crabtree. This includes things like cases of multiple personality in which a hidden personality uh, is running concurrently with the everyday personality, knows more than it does, knows what it is doing, but not vice versa. All very difficult to account for in conventional neuroscientific terms. A uh, chapter which I think uh, at this point really represents the heart of the subject, uh, out of body and near death experiences. And in particular, let me just say near death experiences occurring under extreme physiological conditions, such as deep general anesthesia and or cardiac arrest. And the reason why that's important is that there is a very strong consensus within contemporary neuroscience about the conditions that are necessary for conscious experience. And those conditions are basically obliterated under the circumstances I mentioned. And yet people are not only having experiences, but having the most intense and transformative experiences of their entire lives. Mystical experiences essentially had under less than optimal circumstances where you might in fact die. Uh, we also have chapters on genius, which was a big uh, core of Myers's interests and on mystical experience. And the, the basic story about both of these things, but especially mystical experience, 
is that contemporary uh, psychology and neuroscience have done rather badly with both, especially the latter. Uh, but a good case can be made, and my co-editor, Paul Marshall, makes it very well in his own books and also in a chapter in Beyond Physicalism, second book, published in 2015, that mystical experiences can be understood as kind of windows into deeper parts of reality that we somehow need to take into account in our general picture of the nature of reality. Um, and let me say that for me personally, one of the main uh, effects of Irreducible Mind was that it essentially upheld the, the model advanced by Myers and then elaborated by James, according to which the relationship of mind and brain and the correlations between mental things and physical things that everybody agrees upon can be understood in a different way in which mind and brain are uh, somehow functionally distinct, maybe ontologically distinct, but not necessarily so, and normally cooperate, and that accounts for the correlations, but the mental part can operate on its own. And that's shown especially by those near-death experiences under extreme conditions. And for me, that kind of removed the logical obstacle to survival I had been really uh, rather hostile to the idea of postmortem survival up to that point. But uh, since then, and not just because I'm getting older, uh, have become much more uh, sympathetic to it. In fact, I'm inclined to think that, um, um, well, let me go uh, way, way back. Uh, Henry Sidgwick, somewhere very near the founding of the British SPR in 1882, made the point that although we should be interested in uh, collecting data, we had to do more than that because uh, a big pile of facts by itself will not be sufficient to persuade the scientific and academic community. What we have to get to is some way of understanding how nature is built such that these things can happen. And that's the phase that I feel we're very much in now. I mean, I certainly, uh, uh, want more good experimental and observational work to go on and hope that happens. Uh, but I think our most urgent need right now is for a good theory that can uh, help us to understand these phenomena while remaining consistent with the best of contemporary science. And there are several other people who are working in the same direction. I mean, uh, Whitehead, for example, in the early 20th century, was a guy who knew a lot about relativity in particular, quantum theory too, probably, and realized that those things entailed big shakeups in our, our basic picture of reality and tried to create a whole new metaphysics that would have that property. He was interested in and apparently sympathetic to most of the psi phenomena, as have been some of his followers, in particular, David Ray Griffin. Um, anyway, so... Uh, that was the end of Beyond Physicalism. We assembled a whole bunch of uh, uh, theories, both ancient and modern, which uh, uh, accepted the reality of the phenomena and attempted to give a picture of the world that would make sense of them. Uh, we just recently published a third book in the series. This one is called, I don't know if you can see it, Consciousness Unbound. Actually, this one, I'll read the uh, subtitle liberating mind from the tyranny of materialism. We chose that very deliberately as a kind of thumb in the eye of the opposition. Uh, uh, it contains, by the way, um, state of the science summaries for three big areas, uh, near-death experiences, cases of the reincarnation type, and precognition. Precognition in particular gives a lot of uh, philosophers and physicists heartburn because of its obvious sort of connections with things like determinism, free will, and so on and so forth. Great chapter in there by Bob Rosenberg, who John met very early in our Sersim period, Esalen. Uh, then we also have a bunch of um, uh, either um, extensions of previous theories or introduction of new ones in part two. And there are a couple in particular I want to mention. One is by Max Vellman, a very well-known guy in the world of consciousness studies. Max is a, an advocate of what's called dual aspect monism, 
uh, which attempts to preserve what's been accomplished on the physicalist side while coupling it to a, a, a subjective first person consciousness side. Uh, and he does about as good a job, I think, as can be done with that point of view. I personally don't think it's sufficient. And there's some discussion in a final chapter by Paul Marshall, which surveys the whole theoretical landscape in a really elegant way. I recommend that strongly. Uh, there's another one. Uh, that, well, there's one by a man named Bernardo Castrop that some of you may have come across. He's a he's an idealist, out and out idealist. He's tremendous. He's a one man army. That guy he publishes books about twice a year. Um, uh, you can find him easily on the web with uh, pointers to his books. Um, another one uh, that's of special interest to me for a variety of reasons is involves a man named Federico Fagin. He's a pioneer of the microelectronics industry, a uh, physicist, Italian physicist, who uh, unbeknownst to the uh, public world began having mystical experiences about 30 years ago, which quickly convinced him that physics needs to be rebuilt from the ground up. You know, not altering anything fundamental, but putting it on a deeper sort of basis with consciousness at the very bottom of things. And he is now working on that project. He's already published a couple of articles and there's a chapter in our book, of course, about this, covers this. Um, he's working with an Italian physicist named Dariano who was independently attempting to derive all of classical and quantum physics from what he calls informational principles. Um, I won't attempt to uh, say what that is. I can't say I understand it very well myself, but the important thing is that Federico has teamed up with him with the idea that those informational principles themselves can be grounded in a supreme consciousness of some sort at the base of things. And if they succeed in that program, and this guy Dariano, I mean, he's a really heavy duty uh, foundations of physics guy. If they succeed in this, what it amounts to is draining physics of its traditional, quote, physical content and making, moving the whole subject in the direction of idealism. Anyway, I think I've probably used up my time. Um, I guess what I would like to end with is just to say that uh, really for the first time in my career, I feel like we're really getting somewhere that we're we're within sight of a uh, revised science-based worldview that is both consistent with the best in modern science and also makes room for uh, spiritual and paranormal experiences that we have not been able to accommodate with any uh, uh, consistent kind of theoretical scheme to now. And if we, if we can do that, I think our prospects for getting a real hearing in the scientific community and the world at large are greatly improved. So there. Okay. <laughs> really big view. A variety of phenomena outside even what is normally regarded as tri phenomena. I, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, then it is a challenge to have it accepted, but I mean, <laughs> Just to describe this view is very important. Then it's a question how to how to have it accepted and, and reach out. But it's a very good view. You, you really pick up a lot of phenomena. That it's very good. Uh, okay, over to John. Do you, John? How did you come into this field and what phenomena are you primarily interested in? Uh, yes, I can talk about that. I mean, uh, the, the trouble about my speaking today is that when you have a speaker on a subject, you usually expect him to have more information about the subject than the audience. And uh, this has been reversed in this case. There's hardly anybody listening to me now who doesn't know more about this than I do. So it's hard to think what I can uh, contribute, except uh, uh, I have been interested from, uh, I do it a, a playing card guessing game. 
in Cardiff with a good friend when I was 18. And although I'd never studied statistics, because we don't teach anything as vulgar as that in England, um, I, I was quite convinced that what was happening was not explicable. But there was very little of this information out there. And then I began reading Arthur Kersler. And of course, when Kersler died, he left his money to um, a university that would start a department to research this stuff, and he left it to Edinburgh. And I've been up to Edinburgh and met the person. But the trouble is, I'm a dilettante. Um, most of my approach to things is psychological, almost instinctively. Uh, which is how I got involved in programs on the BBC in the mid 50s about psychology. And in those days, I thought psychology was B.F. Skinner and rats and pigeons. And so I was trying to study biology. Um, the, the teaching was so terrible that I realized I would never actually pass the exam. So I switched to physics, which I was only partially interested in. And I've been following this ever since. I was lucky enough to get to know Michael um, at, uh, at Esalen. And uh, I, I went to those meetings for about 10 years and met some absolutely fascinating people. Charlie Tart, for example, who was the one who told me about one experiment that he'd gathered. He had a, a, a young woman um, who was an au pair who was in the family, and she just mentioned, mentioned at a meal one day, quite casually, that she had out-of-body experiences. And he said to her, could, could we uh, do, do a little experimental thing? So he set up a bedroom where she could sleep, and above the bed was a, 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 a board, a shelf, on which they placed a five-digit uh, um, randomly um, generated number. And uh, there were six occasions when they uh, watched her during the night as she slept. And on one occasion, and only one, she said, yes, I had an experience last night. And uh, when I was at the top of the room, I was able to look down. And she gave Charles the five-digit number. Perfect. And... Uh, Charles told me there are people who have tried to explain it. Oh, there's a reflection on the glass and the clock, this kind of thing. And he said, it's all nonsense. Now, once you hear about a, an out-of-body experience like that for the first time, you just realize it alters everything because only one of those has got to be true. Uh, and then you have to uh, uh, look for it in the, your entire philosophy. And then I think what began to astound me was the resistance in amongst most scientists to any of this kind of thought. Um, and you now find, as far as I can see, evolutionary biologists who think that everything can be explained by their theory of evolution, except for a couple of minor things like the origin of life and the emergence of consciousness. And they then sort of say, well, they don't matter. Consciousness is just an epiphenomenon, you know, just a reflection of chemical processes in the brain. Whereas for most of us, the fact that we are sitting here now listening to each other is about the only thing we can be absolutely sure of. And I'm fascinated when science says that the one thing that Descartes took to represent the fact that he could actually say that he existed, which is that he could doubt whether he existed. And if he doubted whether they were uh, whether he existed, then there must have been someone doubting it. You know that they are now denying this and saying, no, this really doesn't matter. And it reminds you that the basis of science is measurement, that most of science has progressed astoundingly by measurement, but then that follows that after a time, scientists say, well, um, if you can't measure something, it can't be very important. Uh, and the next day <laughs> is to say that it isn't important at all, and the next stage is to say that it doesn't exist. And this is the kind of thinking that theoreticians have to indulge in in order to try to get rid of data that they simply can't explain. And uh, I was a fan of Richard Feynman, the, um, the quantum physicist, and I love things he said. Like he said, if anyone um, thinks they understand quantum physics, then they haven't understood quantum physics. You know, and Niels Bohr said that when you first approach quantum physics, um, if you don't find it shocking, you haven't understood it. 
and um, you know Max Planck, who was uh, you know right at the start of the quantum physics uh, revolution, who was uh, said at one time that um, the scientists, uh, sorry, science progresses one funeral at a time. In other words, people start become so attached to their theories that they simply can't let go of them. And if you read um, that. Um, uh, Thomas Kuhn's book, 1962, about the structure of scientific revolutions, which you realize is that scientists are passionately, passionately attached to a particular theory, and they will fight to the death uh, to, to, to defend it. And even Einstein, who comes up with relativity and God knows what else, when quantum physics comes along, he says, I cannot believe that God plays dice with the universe so he couldn't make the next step. And it's that um, intention of just hanging on to what you believe. And I read recently about economists that almost all economists early on in their career either decide that Milton Friedman or that, um, oh, who was the great, uh, um, who was the great uh, British economist, I, I forgot his name, uh, who, who wrote about the consequences of the First World War. Can you tell me? I'm embarrassed because it's the most normal. Anyway, these two people <clears throat> have very different views. And this uh, article said that scientists, uh, that uh, economists seem to make up their mind quite early on uh, as either favoring Milton Friedman or, or this other guy. And uh, to the, uh, and they very, very seldom uh, switch to the other camp. In other words, they become so attached to the first theory that they uh, use the confirmatory bias to make absolutely sure they never have to change their minds. And that is an absolutely extraordinary thing about human beings, because we know that this is true politically, if we look at people's attachment to political parties, but to think that this is the, the, um, the domain of science, this is the way scientists behave, is, 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 is rather shattering. And it's the opposite of what Richard Feynman said. He said once that uh, he thought that science began not when people shouted Eureka, but when somebody said, hmm, that's odd. And they're not interested in anything that's odd. And the, the most interesting thing I've read in the last few years is a book by Ian McGilchrist. And I don't know if you know him, but I really do suggest you do. Um, and he's just written a 1,500-page thing called The Bat matter with things, but I started with uh, the master and his emissary. Um, and he's an extraordinary man. He taught to English at Oxford, and then he decided that you shouldn't try to explain poems. You should only try to understand them, to experience them, I'm sorry, experience them. And then he became a doctor. He walked away from his teaching role at Oxford. Then he became a psychiatrist. Then he went to Johns Hopkins and studied neuroscience of the brain. And he's written a book that is really about the two hemispheres and the fact that they're quite different. But I mean that physically, they are not symmetrical and that they have completely contrasting views of the world. And although they're extraordinarily interconnected, you can say that one side of the brain has certain characteristics and another side uh, the other side has different characteristics. The right-hand side of the brain is the one that gives context and meaning to things and understands irony. And the left-hand side of the brain is very, very good for calculation, for exploitation, for producing things and for controlling things. And that there's an inherent contrast in the two, and that since the Enlightenment, the uh, left hemisphere has been dominant because it likes to be dominant in the same way that the Catholic Church burned heretics, but you don't get any mystics burning anyone, if you see what I mean. So that's all I have to offer at the moment, just a, a, a few ideas of, of what's extraordinary about it all and the fact that it gets ignored. Except I should add something because I was always interested in whether there was anything in religion. A, a speech given by Aldous Huxley in Santa Barbara in the 60s in which he distinguished between uh, two types of religion. The religion that puts everything into words and dogmas that you have to believe this or else you are not a member of the religion and the, the people who are interested in having what they would describe as an experience of god and when you have the gnostics who are rather in the second camp you have them wiped out 
by the Catholic Church, because the Catholic Church is ultimately about power. Because although Christ was not like this, after you have an organization, my friend Robin Skinner, with whom I wrote a couple of books on psychology and psychiatry, he, he said that once you get into an organization at the beginning, the people who organize it are fascinated by the content. The next generation who admire the, the pioneers and want to learn from them, the next generation is enthusiastic. But, by the time you got to about the fifth generation, they're really joining because there's a good dental plan. You see what I mean? And, and their understanding in spiritual things in uh, something like a church gradually takes over. So you get the power seekers in charge, hence the reaction of the Catholic Church to the sexual abuse cases, which is nothing to do with Christianity and always to, all to do with power. And yet the Catholic Church is supposed to embody Christ's teaching, which is ridiculous. Although, as a friend of mine once said, if you're trying to expound a doctrine of tolerance and humility and poverty, then you need a very rich, powerful authoritarian organization to do it. <laughs> That's all I have to contribute, folks. But I hope that gave one or two people things to think about. Oh, yes. Very good. Very glad to hear that. A little uh, other opinions. And than Ed. Uh, sorry if I was confused with my with my picture on the screen, but I, I have a, I used the internal camera now, so it works again. Uh, one thing I could ask you, John, did you have any experiences of your own of this kind, Tele like telepathy? I only had. Yes, I only had one in my life. I was very interested in the Gurdjieffian ideas for a long time. Uh, I had a connection with the American group through a philosopher called Jacob Needleman. And I got invited to a 10 day kind of, I don't know what you call it, um, session. And it was a fascinating session, but at one point at breakfast, um, the guy who was in charge, it was called Lord Pentland, who ran the American Goji of Society, sat down opposite me at breakfast, and he asked me a question about some music the previous night, and as I answered him, I realized I was talking bullshit. And then for a very, very few seconds, I had a completely different experience of the world. It was like a very rapid transmission of individual uh, um, images of what was around me, but it was a rat a tat of these experiences. And uh, it only lasted a few seconds. I think I was picking up the salt. And then it stopped and I heard Lord Pentman say to someone, I missed your question just now. I'm sorry, I was distracted. And I became, I know that he gave me that experience. And shortly afterwards, I went out on my own and sat down and started weeping because I realize that everything I do is designed to somehow have an effect or impress other people, that nothing was coming from myself. That was an absolutely unique experience, and I'm sure he gave it to me. So that was when I really began to think there's things going on here that, that very few people are talking about. And the one thing I would add is that when I was at the at DOPS, in Virginia, um, one of the people there said that she had uh, talked to a woman who'd said to her husband, um, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, should tell you that I've got a film crew arriving because I had a, a near death experience once and I wanted to talk uh, about it on camera. Uh, but I'd never told you, you know, because I've sort of was a bit embarrassed. And the husband said, well, I had one too, and I didn't tell you because I was embarrassed. And I think that's why so little of this stuff is out there, because people are crazy that the ordinary normal people are going to think they're crazy. Yeah, they don't understand it at all. <clears throat> so they often just dismiss it. It's out, yeah. out of what is possible to happen. Yeah. And they just don't understand it. But so I course, think the most important thing is to try and get an idea out there that this stuff is happening all the time and that many people are having these experiences and that they need to be talked about because they're very important in terms of, of the way we look at the world. But as Ed says, the, the key is to find some kind of um, theory or quasi theory which enables people to talk about this without thinking that they're uneducated loonies. Yeah. Well, I have noticed that many researchers involve quantum physics in these phenomena, and that I realize it makes it 
quite difficult to uh, present a, a theory that is easy to understand. I mean, it's yes. a challenge is so many disciplines, physics, biology, psychology, theology. I mean, one question I have in mind is when we talk about consciousness unbound, and when we talk about consciousness, is this uh, unbound consciousness something that can be similar to what we call God? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was also theology. So it's quite a radical change of view in many disciplines. And so I can understand it's a challenge for most people, at least uh, scientifically trained, trained. Even if normal people can have an interest, but they don't understand how far reaching it is. That's a politically tough one for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you, John, in your comedian world, uh, have you noticed any interest or phenomena of these kinds? Not at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, that's what I always felt slightly lonely in Monty Python because none of them were the slightest bit interested in this stuff. No. Well, I, I don't think there's anything more important. If somebody said to me, what's the most important question in life? I would say, is there an afterlife? That matters more than anything. But you say it to most people, and they're thinking about getting a better car, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. OK. Um, so I think we could perhaps invite questions now. Uh, I guess there are a few ha has come. Can you connect, Rasmus? Um, I believe Rasmus just ran for a quick break. He will be back in a second. Okay. okay. <laughs> Very conveniently, obviously, but yeah. uh, he will be back soon. <laughs> uh, I could have a question to you, John. I saw in the paper, in an interview with you last year that you had ideas to do a series of a TV series. Yeah. Uh, has, has anything happened with that idea? I'm sorry, it broke up at that very moment, just as you asked the last question, sorry. Okay, I noticed in the interview for about a year in the Sydney yeah. morning uh, that you mentioned you had the idea of making a TV series about the scientific yeah. interest. I would love to do this. I mean, this is what I would like to be doing at this stage of my life. But unfortunately, and I'm being quite serious, the divorce cost me 20 million. And I never had that much money anyway, because I used to work for the BBC. My favorite joke was, I do a lot of work for charity, most of it for the BBC. So I've been sort of struggling to earn a living, particularly with the COVID around. But once I've managed to get a nest egg and a little place in the sun, then I'll devote myself to this because I think I can present it in a way that makes it pretty palatable for the average viewer. And Ed knows I've been talking about this for some time, but the COVID's not helped me get in a comfortable financial position. Okay, okay. So you have the idea and we'll, we'll see when time yeah. comes. <laughs> yes. But I think there is there is a very important role in this for humor because it is kind of funny that people resist these ideas in the way that they do. And I think it can be expressed humorously. Um, I was trying it in a speech recently when I was talking about the evolutionary biologists uh, you know, um, denying that there was consciousness and when the one thing we know is that that's the one thing we know. And that is very, a very funny position, really. And I was able to talk about Richard Dawkins and sort of saying, well, that maybe he is not interested in the fact that he is conscious. Maybe it doesn't matter to him that he functions better in a state of unconsciousness. Do you see what I mean? <laughs> there's, a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of humor in that. And, and I would use that kind of thing in a program like this, because if you get too earnest or the slightest bit angry, uh, then people switch off. Yeah, I think humor is a very good way to reach out. 
and uh, yeah. open your mind in, in some ways if you're yeah. not only critical minded. Yeah. Well, I have, a, I have the idea for a sketch when somebody is explaining at the beginning what nonsense phrenology was, and then they start explaining how various parts of the brain control various parts of human behavior, and you realize it's almost exactly the same map. Do you see what I mean? In one case, they're saying this, is, this kind of mapping is ridiculous, and the others, uh, I know that that's only got a little bit of truth, but there's, there are humorous things, and then you can go on about DNA, you know, and how there is a gene that it predisposes people to think that everything is determined by uh, DNA. And there's another gene which other people have, which determines that they're not all determined by DNA. You see what I mean? You can, you can break the... What it's about, I think, is literal mindedness. I think the most dangerous people in the world are the literal minded ones. And you see that because fundamentalism in religion is literal mindedness incarnate. Do you see what I mean? Mm. Whereas the more relaxed attitude, the Richard Feynman attitude, when he said that I would rather live in a state of quite pleasant um, uncertainty than to pretend that I'm certain about things that I know perfectly well I can't be certain about. Mm. Um, that seems to me a wonderful philosophy. Hey John, uh, one you'd like is a uh, remark from Whitehead. And uh, I think will. we've frozen the picture again because here I am in the middle of Los Angeles and there's slight interference. I'm sorry about this. No, it's still, ah, now there's a little bit of movement. Yeah. Can you hear me, Goran? I'm very sorry about this. I'm in a five-star hotel in the middle of Los Angeles and there's a problem with the reception. Don't ask me. I asked them to fix it yesterday and they said they had, so I'm very sorry. <laughs> yeah. Now I, now I think it works. Good. Were, you were, you to, were you able to hear what I was saying? No. You were? The uh, comment I wanted to pass on to you, John, from Whitehead, he remarks somewhere that uh, scientists animated by the purpose of proving themselves purposeless constitute an interesting subject for study. I'll send it, to, <laughs> I'll send it by email. Oh, love it. That's very good. That's very good. Yeah. And uh, it was a... Uh, famous physicist, I'm trying to think of his name. Oh, I don't know. More questions, I think, or... Uh, do you need me? Uh, I had to run away from the computer, so are you, do you want questions from the chat? Yeah, I think it's time for that. All right. Uh, well, I'll take them in order and we'll see how many we can, uh, we can do. Uh, the first one is from Erik Nissen, and he wants to know more about your own experiences in the area of telepathy, uh, psi, and other uh, of these phenomena? I don't have it myself. Me either. All right. Well, that was, that was a Very quick. <laughs> yes. Sir. yes. Uh, next question is from uh, Peter Eastham. Uh, and it says, if we go from one extreme belief, physicalism, to the opposite extreme, idealism, then wouldn't we have to react all objective or scientific knowledge? I'd like to speak to that. Uh, this has been a thorn in my side for a long time. Uh, yeah, it's, it's usually put in a slightly different way. Even uh, physicalists who are willing to admit that they're having difficulty explaining how brain processes could manufacture consciousness. Uh, when confronted with the prospect of idealism, their response is, well, you have exactly the opposite. How are you going to explain matter out of consciousness? And uh, that, I found that quite forceful for a long time. Uh, but over the past couple of years, uh, I've shaken it off, and I'd like to explain why, if I can. There is a slight but very important asymmetry between the explanatory demands placed upon the physicalist and the idealist. We know we are conscious. There's no ambiguity about that whatsoever. As John has said repeatedly, it's the only thing we're really sure of is that we have experience. 
And what we've been looking for is ways of understanding that. Now, matter, as, as portrayed in classical physicalism, is a construct that was arrived at over centuries with the advent of physics. What the idealist has to explain is not matter. It is to explain the regularities of experience that we invented the concept of matter and associated things in order to explain. And that's what some of our idealist friends like Bernardo Castrup and uh, Federico Fagin and other idealists are attempting to do. Bernard, I see you sitting there. You're so backlit that you're, it's like you're in the dark. But I hope you'll chime in here at some point. Bernard uh, has an excellent chapter in Beyond Physicalism, by the way, on his yes, approach I, to these things. I've, I've seen that, yes. So next. Okay. Next question. Um, uh, and Åke Tegge Gren wonders if it would be possible to get a list of writers and books, books that you mentioned earlier in the seminar, Ed. Um, let me think about how best to do that. Uh, by the way, anybody wants to find out about our work can just uh, Google uh, DOPS, D-O-P-S, space U-V-A. That'll take you right to the our website, the Division of Perceptual Studies. And there's tons of stuff there, copies of papers and things, pointers to books. Uh, but I will send to uh, Joran um, some kind of a short list of what we've talked about. Yeah, and I can send it to I, I would, I'd like to put in a word again for, for, for um, the master and his emissary. Hmm by uh, Ian McGilchrist. I think it's the most important book I've ever read. And he's now got one out, as I said, called The Matter of Things, which is an extraordinarily long and dense book, but it's basically um, destroying physicalism. Okay, I recognize the name, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, next question is from Matt Colborn. And uh, this is also for Edward Kelly. Uh, researcher Anil Seth has recently claimed that the evidence shows consciousness can be understood in terms of brain based hallucination. How might they, this be reconciled with filter models of consciousness? Uh, it cannot, but I happen to think that Anil Seth is wrong. Uh, he's a very determined physicalist. Uh, he systematically avoids contact with any kind of evidence that threatens his position. Uh, interestingly enough, in uh, Irreducible Mind, I advanced a similar conception of how the system normally works. That is, the mind is generating in a sort of a virtual reality kind of sense its current understanding of the environment that the person is finding himself in. That's exactly the same kind of picture that Seth advances, except that he thinks it's all done by the brain. I think that the, uh, can I say something? I, there, there's a very good story about Richard Dawkins appearing uh, with Rupert Sheldrake on a BBC program. And uh, during the course of it, um, Dawkins said he didn't think there was anything uh, in any of this stuff that Rupert's interested in. And Rupert said, well, I sent you a lot of stuff, uh, literature, so that you could read it uh, and we could discuss it on this program. And uh, Dawkins said, well, I didn't read it because I knew it was rubbish. You know, once you're up against that kind of physicalist argument, you just, what do you do? Yeah. And you see, I think the idea that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the ke chemical reduction in the brain and consciousness, I, I, I think it's a sort of naivety, but boils down to literal mindedness. And I think literal mindedness is a characteristic of people who are fundamentally anxious. 
because uh, if you're anxious and you think stereotypically and you cling on to the ideas you have because those ideas are part of your personality. But if you're not anxious in that way and you have a personality of your own, then your views are not actually yourself. Your views are things that you hold and which you can uh, adjust without your personality being adjusted. But people who have ingested ideas and made them part of themselves are never, ever going to change them. Uh, if I could just add to that a bit, I mean, certainly at this stage of my career, I have very little interest in fighting these kind of rear guard actions against people for whom physicalism is a kind of secular faith. That's and right. If they want to brand exactly. me a heretic, fine. At least they won't burn me at the stake, probably. You know, there's a distinction between the map and the territory that some Polish mm. epistemologists may count somebody or other, which is that if you're looking at a map of some territory and you've got the territory in front of you, and there's no bridge over there, but there's a map on the bridge. <laughs> there are some people who say, well, obviously there's a bridge. <laughs> because the map's more important than the territory. No, that's not science. In science, the data comes first and the theory comes second. But if you have a, a theory um, that won't explain something, then the only thing you can do is revise your theory or say that that something doesn't exist. <laughs> Quite true. Quite true. Okay, we're moving on with the questions then. Uh, yeah. Next one is from Rose Thomas. And she asks, when we talk about physical or non-physical, how, how exactly do we define these terms? For example, suppose psi is explainable in terms of quantum mechanics, and some people think, if this is so, it's not exactly non-physical, is it? Well, yeah. Um without getting too far down in the weeds. Uh, the physicalism that I'm speaking of is the modern philosophical descendant of the materialism of previous centuries. And it's specifically anchored in the physics of the late 19th century, according to which, you know, reality consists at bottom of little solid self-existence, something or others flying around in fields of force in accordance with mathematical laws and everything else is to be built out of that. Uh, there's no quantum theory or relativity anywhere in here. Uh, and this is the kind of physicalism that is the implicit or explicit belief system of probably 90 something percent of the scientists that I deal with, namely psychologists, neuroscientists, biologists, that sort of thing. Whether some, you know, improved physical includes all the latest uh, developments in physics might overcome the limitations of the classical physical remains to be seen. And I'm not sure it would be meaningfully different from idealism at that point, but we shall see eventually. Yes, I mean, you got people like Gail and Strawson who solves the problem by declaring that consciousness surprise after all it is physical. Yeah. Can it be the <laughs> things that is that one? Hmm? <laughs> yeah. I'll send you a reference, John. Yeah. People don't want to uh, people don't want to be wrong. I remember reading the varieties of um, religious experience by uh, William James all those years ago, people who'd had um, conversion experiences, and they always happen when the ego had collapsed. You see, where they would have hit rock bottom and all of a sudden something had come in. So the only way you can take in this new information is to get your ego out of the way and stop trying to be right, regardless of the evidence. Okay, it's next. All gone quiet over there. Yes, next question. This one is from Jim Alexander. It's more of a statement, but I think maybe you have something to say about it. Uh, a few points. There is more evidence that we continue than that we don't. The body is just part of the soul. 
Science is limited by the belief that all is physical. Stop thinking it's all about the body, it is all about the soul. Look down the other end of the telescope. Accept that we will never know the answers whilst in the physical, forget the scientists move forward. Any, any thoughts on that? I didn't hear it well enough, I'm sorry, Ed. I had trouble also, to be honest. Oh, I'm sorry, I'll take it again. A few points. There is more evidence that we continue than that we don't. The body is just part of the soul. Science is limited by the belief that all is physical. Stop thinking it's all about the body, it's all about the soul. Look down the other end of the telescope. Accept that we will never know the answers whilst in the physical. Forget the scientists move forward. My wife, Emily, is here and she would like to say something. Well, no. Okay. Well, I guess my one. Can you hear? Yeah. I guess my Let's one. Let's say hi to John, too. Yeah. Hi, John. <laughs> I guess my one reaction to that was the last phrase about forget the scientists because, you know, you can forget the. Hi, hi Emily. Hi, hi John. You can hi. forget the individuals who are taking certain positions, but we can never forget that science is just a method. It's not a point of view. And so don't say forget the scientists. Yeah. Uh, that, that was my big reaction to what he had to say. So, I mean, I think what Ed and his colleagues are trying to do is to take that method and apply it to physical, to um, the questions about if you want the soul. So let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Yeah. Yeah, you know, what a bunch of us, including a bunch of people that I've only recently learned about, are trying to do is find a way to expand science such that it's able to explain more of human experience, including, you know, paranormal stuff and genius and mystical experiences in particular. But I love what Emily says, you know, it's a, science is a method of inquiry. It's not a set of commandments well, true. and it, it, it is treated as a set of commandments by people i think who are literal minded on account of their deep anxiety that means they want to cling on to something because they can't admit that none of us really know what any of this is about oh four all right uh, this next question kind of segues from, from the last statement, and it's from uh, Margaret B. And she, she says, uh, mainstream science appears to be finding that the presence of conscious observers can influence the outcome of experiments. Perhaps that will open the door for the exploration of consciousness to attract more funding and to and so enhance progress. But I wonder if mainstream scientists might be reluctant to be involved in the more esoteric side of such exploration. Well, that's certainly true. We know that. Well, if you've done a lot of work based on one theory, you're not. Go on, Ed. I mean, we, we certainly run into people of that sort. Uh, there, there, I think there's quite a large community of sort of fellow travelers, that is people who are uh, uh, sympathetic to what we're doing in psychical research, but kind of staying in the closet for now because it's so threatening to their, potentially threatening to their reputations and careers. And that, I mean, that's, that's the actual state of things. So that's wise. I'd also like to say on, in defense of, uh, scientists that you know most of them are very busy people and what they learn about uh, psychical research they learn either from uh, what they see in the tabloids as they go through the checkout line at the supermarket or from one or one or another of these very uh, loud and uh, publicly visible critics of parapsychology who by and large are behaving very badly as critics um Yeah. Yeah. True. yeah, what do we do about that? Not clear. <laughs> uh, 
perhaps the future will will solve it for us. Uh, the next question is from uh, Antje Bosselman Rukvi. I'm so sorry if I slaughtered your last name. Uh, uh, but uh, the question is, John highlights the main problem, not the lack of evidence, but the resistance from the establishment. How do we overcome that? Mm. Uh, you uh, make good television programs putting uh, the facts forward uh, in a very low-key way. And you tell the stories like the one about um, Charlie Tart and, and the woman who was able to give him the five-digit number and say, well, uh, <clears throat> there are various explanations of this, but uh, let's examine them. And, and you try and lay these down until somebody sees something that they can't explain, which without any doubt actually happened. And there are a lot of these experiments, too, you know. I mean, I was reading recently, um, there's a book, and I've forgotten the woman's name, which uh, describes uh, something that happened in a hospital where uh, a Hispanic woman who was in, you know, was a patient, um, said that she'd had a near-death experience and, uh, that she'd, um, or was it an OB, pretty much the same anyway, she'd left her body and she'd gone around the outside of the, the building, of the, the hospital. And uh, had, one of the things she'd noticed was that in a window ledge, uh, the, on the right, the other side of the hospital, there was a tennis shoe. And one of the nurses was, was could have went and checked it out and she looked around and yes, there was a tennis shoe on uh, the uh, windowsill of a room right the other side of the hospital. Uh, which couldn't be seen from the ground and was uh, had never been noticed before because people would have opened it up and brought it in. So uh, how did this woman in her out-of-body experience know there was a tennis shoe there? And I had an example two days ago. My wife has a, a, a psychic and uh, the psych and uh, my wife's uh, best friend who's a ballerina, a prima ballerina called Marguerite of Port was talking to the psychic and the psychic who is a very nice lady who lives in the country and has horses and gives riding lessons and is not uh, very knowledgeable about the arts she said there's someone here called something like Rudo, Rudolf Nuraev and this was someone with whom uh, Marguerite Porter had once danced and then she said oh there's someone else here and her name is Margot Fountain Margot Fontaine, of course, and Margot is saying, I remember presenting you with a bouquet of flowers after you danced. And Marguerite said, well, that's what happened. She was there, she danced, and Margot Fontaine came and presented her with flowers. But how did Anne possibly know that? You know, these kind of stories, as you told them, they have a cumulative effect, I believe. There is one, could I? Put a question uh, from the list. Right, there, there is was one question uh, from from Lucy F. Uh, was it's about what do you think will be the first paranormal thing, by example, psychokinesis, psycho ability, etc., that will be proven in mainstream science first. Ed, are you able to quote from Dean Radin's book, you know, Real Magic, Chapter 6? There was a lady who was the president of the American Statistical Association who in her presidential address mm -hmm. said that a lot of these psi phenomena were proved above and beyond any doubt statistically. And it was only because they were controversial that they'd not been accepted. Can you give me chapter and verse for that? Dean I'm Radin really, can. That was just, just, oh, Jessica Utz. Yes. Jessica Utz. Yes, Jessica. Yeah, she was the president of yes. the American Statistical Association. I'd like to uh, answer this question a little bit different way. Um, I have a kind of gut feeling that the thing that will finally break down the resistance, uh, particularly of biomedical scientists, is near-death experiences occurring under extreme conditions. These are coming right out of the heartland of biomedical science. Uh, they depend strongly on our ability to retrieve people from the borderland of death, which is constantly improving. We're going to see more and better stories of this sort, and they're going to get harder and harder for the community to resist. 
Ed, I would like to ask you something. I've often thought that the difference between NDEs and OBEs mm -hmm. is that OBEs tend to be more veridical. Well, I OBEs, mean, there are mm -hmm. OBEs also tend to occur commonly in NDEs, Why usually do... as a kind of early stage of the NDE, which may develop into something more like a full flown, full blown mystical experience. I think that the, 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 it's a lot of the NDEs aren't really veridical, except those extraordinary ones where somebody goes down the channel, down the tunnel towards the light, and their friends are there. They just see friends are there, and they see someone that they didn't know had died. And then when they regain consciousness, they discover that that person had died, but they'd not been informed about it. Yeah, that's a veridical NDE. Yeah. You see what I mean? Whereas an OBE is, as you say, is part of an NDE, but seems to be OBEs are more ver more veridical as with the tennis show. Sure. Can I go now? <laughs> I'm not sure if you're distinguishing OBEs as opposed to the NDE. Uh. We have we have a lot a lot of questions. So do you do you wish to take a couple of more or? Yes, a couple more. Yeah. Uh, the next one is from uh, Cal Cooper, and he this is was for you specifically, Jan. And he says, uh, when we met in November with Ian McGillchrist and Reese Sharesmith, your audience was very receptive to research you mentioned by Rupert Sheldrake and others, which was really pleasing to see. Do you have an interesting experience of negative reception to mentioning parapsychology and consciousness research? And how did you respond? Well, most of my friends think it's rubbish, <laughs> including most of the Pythons, but I think they're not philosophically inclined, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Right, we'll, we'll finish up with a question for Ed then, I, I think. Uh, what is your opinion of Michael Siddhartz and Stephen Brode's case for living agent Psy as opposed to evidence for survival? Do you find it personally convincing? Uh, in a word, no. But this is a really big, complicated subject. Uh, I wrote a review of Michael Siddhartz's book and publish it in the Journal of Scientific Exploration. While I certainly admire his exertions in many ways, I found it ultimately unpersuasive. Uh, there's a big discussion going on right now, by the way. Uh, some of you I'm sure already know about it. Uh, Michael Suddeth has written an enormous paper attempting to tear down the Leininger case. And Jim Tucker of our division is writing a rebuttal to that article, which will appear in the next issue of the Journal of Scientific Exploration. Uh, just by way of preview, Jim doesn't feel that he's done, that Suddath has done the case any serious damage. Uh, thank you. The thank you to the audience for all your questions and thank you for all your answers. And I'll leave the last word to Yaram. Okay, so you had, you have to leave now? <clears throat> uh, well, yes, I have to. <laughs> do my day job now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. We all very much appreciate both your participation and all your comments. You're going to get much better, Goran, you're going to get much better answers from um, from this marvelous man, Ed, than you are from me. So although oh. I should go off now because I got a meeting I'm late for. Um, why don't you why don't you continue with with Ed for a bit? Oh, yes, we can continue if he has some time. Of you can. Yeah. Ed doesn't have to go uh, write songs for a wonder musical. <laughs> <laughs> well, Emily can join us. Okay. Bye. Right, forgive bye, me. Bye. 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 I don't know. Is my microphone working? Yes. Good. I, I don't, John's gone now, but um, maybe you can pass on uh, thanks from the Society for Cycle Research in London as well. I think it's a fantastic effort of you both. Uh, we really appreciate it. I think you, you're a, a good show together. I think you really complete each other. I hope you continue the, <laughs> the show. <laughs>
Well, now that John is gone, I can tell you, uh, having met him in this way has really been a great experience for us. I mean, you know. I think you complement each other in a mm. way. It's good. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. He's quite busy. I have a question for Ed. Um, and I'm, you may be familiar with this. It's it's not an idea that I can really claim for myself. I think it goes back, well, it goes back to Myers and even further to Shakespeare. The idea that we actually create um, these beings that communicate. Um, that it's, if you consider that our consciousness is in some sense universal, and when we are communicating to, to these agencies, the, the, these mediums or spirits, um, they have an identity, but they also have an integrity. They, maybe they're a split of consciousness, a bit like multiple personality, but in, a bit further than this, and that they get their own feeling of, of existing and manage to communicate um, as part, part of ourselves, but nevertheless uh, a, a self that has got its own life and its own identity, and maybe access to memories um, of the... Uh, well, for instance, a deceased person. Um, I don't know whether you considered this. Actually, it could relate to some things that John, I would have loved to have asked John about his experiences with uh, his fellow actors, because yeah. John, uh, actually, mm. uh, he's exploring different parts of himself, but many of the other actors, really, after a while, they become part of the role that they're acting. And I wonder if, in that sense, they they lose their own identity. It's a bit like mediumship. I, would like, I really wonder if some of them have had strange experiences when they, they switch identities. That's a, a great question, actually, Adrian. I think there's a lot to that. I've had a little bit of conversation with um, you know, professional actors, including John. Uh, I think he'd be sympathetic to that view. And by the way, it's uh, virtually identical to the position taken by Mrs. Sidgwick about the status of Mrs. Piper's communicators. You know that yeah. gigantic paper in the proceedings yes, of the SPR, pages one to whatever it is, 630 something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't write papers like that anymore. <laughs> yeah, but that's really about where she ends up. Mm. But there may be some, I mean, she ultimately became convinced of survival, but not that, um, um, George Palou himself was sitting there in full control of Mrs. Piper. It was some kind of collaborative effort between information he had and things that she was doing. Yeah. Which yeah. are very much in the zone you talked about. Mm. But I very much agree with you. It's important we relate it to other phenomena within normal psychology. Yes. Mm. And I know that's uh, Bernard's. Uh, so I'm very sympathetic. Central impulse also. Mm. Okay, is there anybody else who wants to come in? I don't know if we can unmute Bernard, for instance. Um, uh, excuse me, who do you want me to unmute? Bernard Carr might have, I don't know, he's um, vice president of the British SBR. So. I'm just going to find him. There he is. I'm asking. Him there, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, well, oh, Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Oh, thank you, Adrian. I didn't expect to be uh, asked to comment. <laughs> Although, um, Ed, I noticed you invited my comment, and uh, I'm very honoured by that, but I couldn't, I was muted, so I couldn't say anything. Oh. Well, um, let, let, I'll just make a few comments. Um, uh, first of all, about the importance of extending science to accommodate these phenomena. Um, I, I may be expressing a different view from Emily here, but I, I just feel it's really important to expand science from the normal domain of the material world to uh, the domain of mind, and in particular, you know, psi phenomena, and indeed to the domain of, of the transpersonal psychology, the more mystical phenomena. And, and this is, it's really behind a whole movement called the post-material science movement. And, uh, and of course, it's not something which uh, probably most scientists accept, but it seems to me absolutely crucial that if this, this attempt to, you know, make these ideas mainstream is to be successful, it has to be through an expansion of science, by which I mean the, the scientific method, which has been so successful in terms of, you know, 
discovering discerning laws and testing them and things like that and and so and so ed referred to the the second volume the beyond physicalism volume where one is trying to have a theory because the point is however good the data and to me the the data for the existence of these phenomena is is in, incontrovertible and, and and even the evidence for survival one can argue about that but i think there's good evidence for for, for survival too but no one will take it seriously I mean, among scientists, until you have some form of theory. And, and that, of course, was the theme of the second book um, that Ed spoke about. And so the crucial question is going to be, what is the nature of this theory? Now, I'm a physicist and, and I'm very passionate about physics and the way in which physics has been so successful in explaining, you know, all aspects of the universe from the very large to the very small. And therefore, I also I not only think that we need to expand science, I also think in some sense we need to expand physics to accommodate these phenomena, paranormal phenomena and, and uh, uh, even mystical phenomena. Uh, now, of course, that is not a popular view uh, among physicists because most physicists don't believe in, in the phenomena or they don't at least think that they could be part of physics. And it's not even a very popular view among more people of a more mystically inclined um, feelings because they, they feel these phenomena go beyond physics. Now, Ed, of course, referred to the title of his book, which uh, the second volume, Beyond Physicalism, which seems to suggest, well, surely it's a forlorn hope that you can expand physics. The very word beyond physicalism seems to suggest that. However, I do want to stress something which actually Ed himself said, that when Ed talks about physicalism, he's talking about classical physics and and there's no doubt that classical material materialistic physics cannot explain these phenomena but as i'm sure most people know physics has gone well beyond classical physics i mean it, it now incorporates quantum theory and relativity theory i mean relativity theory is really part of classical physics but um and you'll hear a lot of speculation about well maybe quantum theory can explain these phenomena because because quantum theory says the world is very mysterious and you've got entanglement and non-locality and things like this and so there's quite a strong movement even within parapsychologists to try and say quantum theory is going to explain all personally i don't think that quantum theory will explain i think it's relevant to these phenomena because it shows that the observer can play a role in 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 the in the physical world but it's not the full explanation no one's going to explain an OBE, an out-of-body experience or a near-death experience in terms of quantum wave functions. You need a deeper approach. And, and this approach has to go beyond simple basic quantum theory. It's got to go beyond relativity theory. And of course, I have my own theory, which I like, and I don't want to you know, uh, you know, push that onto people now. But uh, all I would say is that physics itself admits that we need a, a deeper theory which will marry quantum theory and relativity theory and which goes beyond space and time. That is part of physics, the expanded physics which physicists are looking for. But it's not what Ed refers to when he talks about physicalism. And my own hobby horse is that the key point about modern physics is it invokes extra dimensions. And there was even a comment about this in, in the chat box that you need these extra dimensions, but they come out of ordinary physics, M theory, for example, and it's not a heretical idea in itself. And my own view is that the higher dimensional, higher dimensions of physics is what you need to accommodate these phenomena to describe a, 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 a sort of a mental space. Now, I've got no time to go into this and I'm talking too much now anyway, but I just want to get across the point that um, I personally think that you, what I, I feel very strongly, you need an expanded science for this to become respectable. And more than that, I think you need an expanded physics. But it's not what we, not what we normally think of by the term physics. It's not materialistic physics. And, and, and clearly consciousness is going to play a crucial role in this expanded, in this expanded physics and expanded science. So not all physicists will, hardly any physicist will believe that. And, and, and maybe, maybe even Ed won't believe that, but that's my personal passionate feeling. And I'm sorry, I've spoken too long already, but thank you for inviting me to comment.
I'm largely in agreement with what you said, Bernard. Thanks. Let me just mention, by the way, uh, um, I've recently become involved with a guy named uh, Tim Eastman. He's a uh, retired plasma physicist and cosmologist or something like that. Uh, but he's been a lifelong sort of closet philosopher as well, starting in the uh, Whitehead tradition, but uh, going considerably beyond that. And he recently published a book called Untying the Gordian Knot, in which he attempts to do exactly what you're talking about, except not, not referring to higher dimensions anywhere in, in his book, as I could see it. Uh, but, and for someone like me, who's not strong in physics, it, it's a hard go. But the point is uh, that he drawing upon very recent developments in the foundations of physics and math and logic, which is his home territory, uh, attempts to put forward a new conceptual framework. I mean, if we had known about this guy at the time we were doing beyond physicalism, we would certainly have invited him to contribute a chapter. Uh, he argues, uh, there are several aspects to it, but the, the, the really critical one, I think, is that he argues for an interpretation of quantum theory uh, somewhat along the lines developed by Ruth Kastner and company, and that has merged now with several other groups working in similar directions. The central point of which is to take seriously Heisenberg's original idea of potentiae and to generalize that and to elevate it, the realm of these race potentiae, to the same ontological status as actuality. That is the potential realm and the actual realm are constantly collaborating in the generation of what is real. And I think you'd find this book actually quite challenging and interesting. It's got tons of, lots of people working in these directions that I had never heard of before. But, and actually what we're doing right now, I mean, we, we approach the same subject, as you know, mainly from the point, of, from a psychological point of view, uh, growing out of Myers, then elaborated uh, philosophically by James, which takes uh, states of consciousness as the key to everything. You know, Myers' basic idea, which James drew upon in varieties of religious experience, and then his later work, is that our everyday consciousness is not all the consciousness there is. It's embedded within a more inclusive and more able consciousness, as he put it, with edits of, and operations of its own that can be used to explain things like religious experiences, mystical experiences, genius, and so on. So we're, Tim Eastman and I are right now beginning a dialogue in which we're looking for sort of connections between his way of doing things and our way, to see if we can fill in some of that seemingly large gap between those strategies. <laughs> Golan, can I reply to Ed? Can I, can I reply? Yeah, I think so. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, about your last remark about consciousness, Ed, I think is fundamental. I, I personally feel that it's extraordinarily arrogant for humans to assume that their form of consciousness is the only form of consciousness that exists in the universe. Um, I, I take the view that um, there can actually that, that there is a hierarchy of consciousness in the universe, of which human beings are just could just be one. Uh, very restricted form. I mean, I always talk about the specious present. The specious present for humans is a is about a tenth of a second. Uh, but to assume that this is the only level of consciousness is to me very naive. I don't see why there shouldn't be uh, consciousness maybe operating on on a nanosecond if you if you're a computer, or why there shouldn't be a mode of consciousness operating on a time scale of hundreds of years if you're some higher level organization. So it seems to me that there, there should actually be a hierarchy of levels of consciousness in the universe going from the very large to the very small. And this is a, it's an old idea, but it's, it's very concordant with the ideas of, of Myers. I agree. Uh, actually, this is a, a big area of development right now in philosophy. I mean, there's a whole bunch of young philosophers talking openly about cosmopsychism you know, it, entertaining the possibility that the universe as a whole has some manner of consciousness associated with it. A good example, by the way, is Philip Goff. Uh, he recently published a book, what's it called? Um, 
Mm. Sorry? Galileo's error. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's just a kind of a, a popular digest of his big book on uh, consciousness as a fundamental reality. Uh, he, he feels confident that, that conventional physicalism is, is dead, basically, even though many of its defenders don't realize it yet. And that philosophy is moving quite strongly in these kinds of directions toward panpsychism and cosmopsychism mm. and so on. It, it seems to so me I think it, we're gaining it, uh, yeah. allies from a different direction. Indeed. And it seems to me the way the main message from both paranormal research and the studies of these more mystical phenomena is that there is a, actually only one mind, you know, that all our minds are connected as part of mind with a capital mm -hmm. M, that there's a, yeah. there's a unified consciousness with a capital C. And to me, the great mystery is how and why does this consciousness with a big C fragment into all these billions of consciousnesses yeah. with a little C? But right. the idea that, that there's only little C and big C seems to me simplistic, that there must be a hierarchy of levels of consciousness as you go from humans, you know, lowly humans to the, to the level of cosmic consciousness. Mm. And, and as you say, I mean, there are other, lots of philosophers are beginning to move in this direction, which I think yeah. is a very encouraging sign. Yeah, I agree. Uh, by the way, another uh, unexpected uh, potential source of allies is in the increasing number of biologists who are willing to take seriously the idea of continuity below the level of humans, not only through animals and birds and so on, but even down to single-celled organisms, plants. There are well, active the, discussions in many of these areas right now. I agree. And, and the point of this hierarchy of consciousness is it not only goes above the humans in some yes. sense, but above it goes below humans as well. Yeah. And you've even got a guy like um, Christoph Koch, you know, Yep. Francis Crick's primary uh, disciple, who uh, in connection with Giulio Tononi and the uh, yep. integrated information theory of consciousness mm -hmm. is entertaining at least a somewhat limited form of panpsychism. Unheard of. Of course, he's taking a lot of flack from that from mainstream biologists and neuroscientists. I, he's I also one well. of the people. I'm That's sorry. a clear measure of change. And yeah. I've always thought if we are going to have something that is like a theory of, every, of everything, even that's a bit arrogant, but let's assume we can, then our own consciousness must somehow embed the universe in order to understand such things, understand how the universe works. We must actually have some level of consciousness that is equivalent to that. Uh, um, in order to un understand the universe itself. I'm not sure if I'm making sense to you, but um, the, the, in order to understand the complexity of the universe, our consciousness must be able to reach that level if the goal, if, if we can achieve a, say, a theory of everything, which some people think we can, I doubt it, but to get a, a glimpse of that, we, our, mm -hmm. um, our consciousness must extend to the extent of being part of the universe. As so above, perhaps, so below. Go back to the, uh, did we have any more questions, Rasmus? Uh, we have a lot of questions. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Depending uh, on how much time Ed has. Can we take a few? Well, Rasmus, we you've done so much to organize all this. We, I think we can delegate it to you and your own um, Common sense to pick out a question that you would like to answer to. Uh, yes, give me. I don't have any direct access to them. Hmm? Uh, I, I think oh. this uh, this question from Jan Flander was really interesting, actually. So I, I I'll take this one. Uh, uh, okay, that near-death experiences somehow make survival of the physical death plausible. What about the idea of reincarnation? Does the evidence for it, like memories and birthmarks, make that idea plausible, in your opinion? Well, certainly uh, that line of work, which was uh, created by the founder of our division at, the U at UVA, University of Virginia, uh, is one of the important uh, new elements of the total evidence picture at this stage of the discussion about survival. And I personally take uh, those cases very seriously. And I think they're again, impossible to explain in conventional terms or even using, uh, you know, living agent sigh. I'm sure everybody knows about the state of the survival 
debate within parapsychology, psychical research. Um, there are two classes of interpretations of the best evidence, one of which is that it's survival is a reality. The other of which is that everything can be explained by psi-like interactions among only living persons and that the survival hypothesis is unnecessary. Um, we've never written very much about it because it wasn't important for our purposes in our books. Either horn of that interpretive dilemma is uh, problematic for conventional physicalism. Um, I personally, I must say, uh, as I explained earlier, one of the consequences of developing irreducible mind for me was to remove the logical objection to survival and to make the existing evidence appear more convincing. You know, William James was astute about everything. And the, one of the points he made somewhere early on in his writings about psychical research was that these things are all tied together in such a way that once you buy into any one of them, the probabilities of all the others change in some way. And I mean, these are all very subjective things. There are no ironclad quantitative rules for how they work. Uh, but it's a fact that for me, uh, acceptance of the Myers-James transmission or filter picture of the mind-brain relationship has made the likelihood of survival seem much greater than it did earlier. Others have different opinions. Well, you are, and I think that's a very positive note to uh, maybe round it off with. Well, yes. uh, I would like to just follow up my question, um, but put it in a different way. <clears throat> are there any serious alternative explanations to reincarnation memories and uh, also the physical evidence of uh, birthmarks that relates uh, to the believed earlier cause of death? Are, are there any uh, valid arguments uh, to, to consider other possibilities than reincarnation? I haven't come across any. Maternal impressions. No. Oh. Um, well, I personally don't think so. Um, but there are some alternatives that should be included in, in the discussion. One, as uh, Emily just pointed out, is possession, as uh, for some, some cases might be a plausible counter explanation. Let me just mention about. Um, what do you mean the possession? Uh, let me just finish this. Um, in terms of the birthmarks and birth defects, I mean, those cases are certainly impressive in in many ways, but they also, I think, open uh, another alternative. Um, and that's because we know about something called maternal impressions, where a pregnant woman, typically in the first trimester, observes some ghastly accident of some sort. And lo and behold, the uh, forthcoming child ends up having a birthmark or defect corresponding to what she was imaginatively in immersed in. Um, you might think about interpreting one of these um, rebirth cases of that type as having something to do with a child somehow becoming aware, say, through ESP or something of that sort of, you know, this ghastly injury. And lots of times, by the way, these injuries really are ghastly. I mean, having fingers lopped off and that sort of thing. And so uh, either the child might do it to himself. Um, do I think that's plausible? No. But can it be decisively ruled out? Not so obvious. And, and Emily wants to add well, something. I just want to add, I mean, I think we could, I'm kind of working on this myself right now a little bit, but the idea that some sort of possession, um, Maybe not necessarily in the way we usually think of it in the way of demonic possession or something, but after all, mediumship is a form of possession. Um, and that something along those lines could account for the reincarnation cases in which a deceased person interacts 
with a developing fetus and child, both physically and mentally. Um, but as I say, it's it's a very complicated thing, and I'm just kind of beginning to work on it myself. But I do think it's worth thinking about as a possible alternative of some sort. Yeah. And it may be that different different cases require different yeah. kinds of yeah. interpretations. Yeah, that's coming through. I have seen a final uh, question I would like to pick up uh, connected with the early one that there may be some kind of consciousness in lower organisms and humans. And I've noticed writings by Bar Marilyn Monk, uh, who is biologist and she's with us. And I noticed that she claims that it seems to be consciousness even in lower biological organisms. Mm -hmm. Uh, which I find interesting to give us an idea of what consciousness might be and that even in animals, and I noticed even in plants and trees, there are indications of intelligence, uh, which raises the question, does intelligence in need some kind of consciousness or is some kind of consciousness? Marilyn Mont, can you come through? Yes, thanks very much. <laughs> yes. Um, I've been thinking about this issue a lot from a purely scientific view. And um, I'm, it's not my field consciousness, I'm a molecular biologist. So I deal with atoms and molecules and cells and tissues and organs development, etc. And I just took Max Planck's statement that he believed that matter consciousness was fundamental, that matter was derivative from consciousness, and wanted to look at that. If I could share my screen for a moment, it would be very clear, a scientific uh, view of matter derivative from consciousness that I think is useful to look at because at least you know something scientifically and you can go beyond that at your will. Can I do that? Well, Unfortunately, I've retreated to the kitchen to make my dinner and um, <laughs> but I can go back to where I need to actually, I'm being warned that my Mac's going to sleep. But I'd love to show you this diagram. And, um, I, I think I think you can share now. Okay, I'm coming up to where I can plug the computer in. Uh, <laughs> oh, what is? I had another Zoom a day, but never mind. This is more important to me. So, um, so share screen. Uh, Oh, wait a minute. I've pressed share screen, but it's not my screen. Oh, I see, you're all on my screen. There, has that come up? No. Um, well, because... Oh dear. I, I tried to share the screen again, again now, so it, it should be possible for you. Well, I, unfortunately, I've when I shared screen, I got just the picture of all of us. Um, but you have you have to put it on on the, on the table then. What you want to share? No, I'm it's, sorry. I've I've got only a picture of Anders Rydberg, Rydberg on yeah. my computer, and it won't show. It won't come up again. The uh, the whole the whole um, mm -hmm. meeting won't come up. Uh, I don't know if Rasmus can do something there. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to try. Oh, there I'm you are. There's everybody. Now, I'm going to try <laughs> share screen again. And what happens, you see, I get um, the desktop's got every picture of everybody on it. So what I'm going to have to do is get rid of everybody somehow. Um, or put you all over there. Now what's happened? No luck. Um, this is a pity. Share screen. Put that right over there, share screen. There you go. What do what you got now? Same. Only your name. Oh, dear. <clears throat> See that? Only your name. Oh. oh, I'm so sorry. Well, I could mention that I have 
met seen some of your writings Marilyn, and I find it interesting so maybe yeah we could... well I think I, I honestly I mean I know uh, I honestly I'm not it's not my feel but I think I've really sorted it out but somehow I can't get the share screen up from behind the fact that everybody on my screen is in the meeting if you know what I mean you see <clears throat> share oh I had to press another button there you go there. Yes. Yes. What have you got? Yes. Have you got Good. a diagram? Yeah. Yep. Well, very, very quickly and clearly, what I was trying to see, how is matter derivative from consciousness, from atoms to molecules, to cells and tissues, to organs, to us, to communities, putting communities into ecosystems, solar systems, planet, uh, uh, galaxies and cosmos. So if this is not a numerical diagram, it's actually just an ancestry diagram turned upside down. Just to see visually, these are atoms coming together to make molecules. Obviously it's not numerical because you have more than two atoms making a molecule. His molecules coming together to make cells, his cells coming together to make tissues, tissues coming together to make organs, organs to make us, us in communities. This is us Life forms, I didn't put humans here because I don't want you think, don't want you thinking about human brains and heart problems. Life forms, flora and fauna, and then uh, populations, lots known about the community of bees and Portuguese man of war jellyfish and, and so on, uh, communities, flocks of birds and swarms of fish. Then I put the communities into ecosystems. An ecosystem is a balanced um, organization of forests and rivers and trees and predators and prey and so on and ecosystems come together to make a planet planet earth and planets and sun come together to make solar systems put a solar system to cosmos and so on now looking at a hierarchy of consciousness taking a definition of consciousness from the oxford dictionary as aware of and responsive to surroundings this whole system here, scientifically, materialistically, mechanistic science, shows how at every level, the components of the system are aware of and responsive to the surrounding. Your electron is aware of and responsive to surrounding. And your electrons, uh, the atoms hold hands through covalent bonds, sharing their electrons in outer organs to make, come together to make molecules. So the atoms are aware of and responsive to the surrounding of the molecule. The molecules come together, uh, 3,000 biochemical reactions in your metabolome in every cell come together to create the cell. The cells come together to make tissues. But the mechanisms of all this, even the service of all these bees, which are epigenetically programmed to do different jobs and so on, and ecosystems, how they come together. You take away the forest, it'll die. Divert a river, it'll die. Take the walls out of Yellowstone Park, it dies, etc. And here, aware of and responsive to surroundings. Um, you know, although we've had an ice age and some meteors hit the planet and we've now got climate change. But it's a matter of, I convert aware of and responsive to surroundings as interconnectedness is the awareness. You're only aware if you're interconnected to things. If you're totally alone in a desert, aware of nothing, you don't exist. In fact, sensory deprivation sort of wipes out your existence. So aware of is the what you're connected, what things are connected to is the awareness. And the responsiveness is a service, the service that's imperative to survival of the higher order structure. Though the parts are in service to their higher order structure to ensure its survival. And another rule of this system is the parts don't know what the higher order structure is, but the higher order structure is looking after the parts. The beehive is looking after the bees. The bees serve the beehive, they don't know that they're doing, and the beehive looks after the bees, etc. etc. So I've converted another definition of consciousness into interconnectedness and service. The service is essential that the high order structure survives. However, it's not really essential because as much as things come together to make higher, more, to increase complexity in evolution, as much as that happens, things are coming apart. So evolution's not going anywhere, no purpose, no direction because extinction equals creation. So in terms of a, a, a huge Lego set, you have a blueprint from the Big Bang of all the things you could possibly make from the components that the Big Bang spits out. And they can increase the complexity. And as you increase the complexity, 
these different levels have their own rules and so on. So if you create a human, things, all my atoms have come together to make molecules and cells and tissues and organs in me to make me, but the, uh, my level, there are rules within my level of complexity that I'll probably survive 80, 90 years and that's it as it were. And, and that's true all the way along. So uh, I don't know, I've, I've done that very, very fast, but do you understand what I'm saying? What, what I hope is, that if you can see what is mechanistic and scientifically known about this particular definition of consciousness, then we can go from, then we've created a line of what's known between what's known and unknown. And then we can speculate more easily from a basis of, of an understanding, a scientific understanding as far as that can go. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 So um, many thanks, Marilyn. Quite new ideas so to uh, give idea of that consciousness is important for psychology and physics and paranormal phenomena, but also in biology. And the paranormal, of course, is due to in any interconnected system you have it can move about. You have reverberation and flux. So you could have all the within all this interconnectedness, it could you know, if I if I could get back my picture, um, where am I? Here I am. Don't know about dinner. I mean, you, an internet system can move and things can come into contact in different ways. So the the, the what I call flux, top down, bottom, middle out, bottom up. In the terms of the paranormal, things you know, in terms of remote viewing or precognition or even telepathy, you could see that it could come that the knowing of all the parts of the whole and the whole knowing about all the parts, that there could be situations in terms of reverberation or flux. Like for instance, uh, I have, I know when friends that I've been close to in my life and that I've loved, even if I know when they die in seven cases, proven that that they've come to me in an early morning dream looking like heaven or in color or start crying or something and in seven cases been proven that um i've made a phone call or written a letter or told somebody that i had that experience of them visiting me in a very heavenly type environment um as they die and i just see that as that as a sort of form of entanglement in this reverberation, if reverberation exists, a form of entanglement that things that were close together, that there's some memory that, that can be recaptured of that closeness, if you know what I mean. But I mean, that's going way out. I mean, I'm a, I'm a biologist, I'm Sorry. not a person. Thank you, Marilyn. Do you think okay. you can close your sc share screen because somehow you shut down my screen? And there I can't go. communicate. Ah, that's much better. Fine. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I'm where we're taking very much of Ed's time. Um, Sorry about that. Right. Do you think we should round it off? Yeah, I think it's actually been a very stimulating meeting. It's more stimulating than, than many conferences, I must say. Very, very yes, interesting, I, I think. think it was a good finish uh, with new ideas about where consciousness might be. So I'm very glad you could con contribute, Mary, and I'm very glad that you could stay with us. Well, the links are in the chat to the recent talk I gave for Galileo. Okay, yes, I, I've seen you on some sessions. Maybe I, I'm interested in something after the summer with you, with Thank consciousness you. In, in new new ways. Uh, many thanks, Ed. I think it's time for us to end up and I appreciate you could stay with us for two hours. Mm -hmm. My pleasure. Thanks. I second that, Ed, Ed. We most appreciate. We we live rather isolated in Scandinavia, yeah. so we uh, we need the contact with the world around. I agree. You know, when yeah. you're when you're uh, sort of fighting the establishment, it really helps to have a little contact with yeah. like-minded yeah. persons. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I can mention we have, we will have Margaret Moga on digital session in two weeks, February twenty-four, about healing our uh, healing research, Dr. Margaret Moga. Uh, okay, many thanks to all of you who have listened. And thanks also to Rasmus and Jessica for mon mm. monitoring this. Um, yeah.
Yes, I, I hope I hope we have. I understand there are many questions we have not had the time to meet. To meet, I hope we can come back to them. Okay, many thanks to all of you. Bye.